<clears throat> Kevin, thank you so much for being a guest on the Tech Guys Who Invest podcast. We are excited for the amount of value you are going to bring our listeners. Well, I appreciate being on. As you know, I, I really enjoy the information. I enjoy the topic, and it's something I've been a part of for over 25 years now. Yeah, we know you as the educator's educator or the trainer. Yeah. That's what it is. <laughs> yeah, trainer's trainer. Yeah, I've been, I, you know, I, I, I enjoy teaching. It's such a, a, an important part of learning uh, something new. And for notes, for most people, that's a topic that's very, very new and foreign to them. And I, I not only uh, study notes and, and uh, curric- uh, but I study how to train as well. How do, how do uh, adults respond in, in, a, in a setting? How, how, what kind of memorization tools can you share with people? That sort of thing. So I really enjoy that part of the industry as well, because it's one thing to teach people this, and it's one thing to listen to your podcast, but are you giving enough information where somebody can actually take that, retain it, and then apply it? So I'm, I, I'm big on uh, educating myself on, on both. Fantastic. Awesome. And sp- speaking of the, the note investing, how would you say note investing differs from other types of asset classes in real estate? Yeah, it's, you know, it's kind of funny. The, 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 it's a part of real estate. It's a big part of real estate. In fact, it's the financial side of real estate. But until probably the last five years, it was always in, in the attitude of the industry, there's real estate, and then there's this note thing. And it was always kind of this smaller side thing that nobody knew a whole lot about. But the reality of it is, it is the financial side of it. You can buy with seller financing. You can sell with seller financing. You can buy loans that are already created. So it is something that once people see it, they're attracted to a lot of the uh, attributes, which a lot of people enjoy. I mean, a lot of people go into investments for, for cash flow, for example. And when you think in terms of buying a rental property, most people buy a rental property for cash flow. Certainly right. there's a degree of appreciation, but we all know that can go either way, especially, you know, over the last 10, 10 years or so. But, um, you know, with, with this, you can get the benefits of positive cash flow without all of the headaches and liabilities of rental properties. So a lot of people start to see that when they get involved in real estate and they, they run into some of the uh, some of the things that all of us run into when you buy rental property or fixer uppers and such, and they start to look at notes quite differently. But I can say today that notes has elevated itself to a class of assets that I really believe should be a part of everybody's portfolio. Nice. I like the way uh, you think about that being part of a portfolio. And um, I know some people focus on, you know, they, they kind of focus on an area of real estate investing. And, um, and you know, if you focus on notes, say that's a bigger part of your portfolio because that's your primary focus. Um, what, what do you think some of the advantages are in note investing versus other asset classes? Why would someone make that their primary focus? Well, I I think the major benefits are that you can get into notes with um, uh, a lot of different exit strategies. And what I mean by that is this, the the note industry itself can deliver a huge amount of, um, Uh, results. Uh, It it depends what you're looking for. For example, if you just want to acquire real estate with less expense and less competition, notes can deliver that for you. You can still buy notes on vacant property, which means you will end up with a property for 30 to 40 cents on the dollar. And I don't think anybody out there is going to find that kind of thing from a motivated seller or at the uh, stair, uh, staircase at the at the courthouse. It's just not happening. People are overpaying for that, but that's only one thing notes can do. Other people don't want real estate. They want to be the bank. They just want to buy the debt instrument on it, and they're going to get positive cash flow, once again, without the headaches and liability of a landlord, but their investment is safe because it's secured by the real estate. If you want lump sum in the business, there are techniques where you can get a lump sum amount of money uh, or a cash flow or both. And it also has a very low cost of entry because I can teach techniques. And and Kevin, you've you've seen some of the techniques I teach on this, which is how to get into the note business without using any of your own money. And there's several ways to do that. So quite frankly, it it has a lot of the positive aspects that uh, uh, real estate has, but even better. Uh, because we don't have a huge entry cost. We don't have uh, the liabilities and, and hassles that a lot of real estate investors run into, especially in a tight market. 
Now, for our listeners that aren't aware, uh, what would be some of those examples or techniques where you can enter into the note investing space without your own money? Yeah, one of the ways you can get into this without any of your own money is a simple strategy of arbitration. And uh, arbitration, really, you, you have one price that you can buy something for. You have another price that you can sell something for. That's all arbitration is, regardless if we're talking stock market or real estate or what have you. So in the note business, we find that all the time. And because uh, everything is based around public records in this, it's easy to look up. In fact, you don't even have to look it up. You can buy names and addresses of people who own notes, just private individuals, and you can do a very simple campaign, a mail, a direct mail campaign out to them to see if they're interested, number one, in selling their note, and number two, how much they're willing to sell that note for. And then you can have other investors or there are well-known companies that invest in those notes in the industry and sell it to them and just make the difference. You know, and that's one way to do it. Another way to do it is to partner. You know, when someone like yourself gets involved in the note business and you spend money for training and, and you spend time and effort looking for deals, uh, creating relationships with people in the industry, it's a big deal. If you're doing all that, you bring something of value to the table. And if you can find a good investment that makes sense, it's easy to sell that to a private investor in your local area. A lot of real estate investors belong to clubs and meetup groups. They listen to podcasts like, like yours and in mine. And if they have investors who are looking for a product but don't have the time uh, uh, nor really the desire to go out and look for it, they want it delivered to them, that can be a gold mine because there's enough in the business where you can structure a deal with somebody and the proposition essentially is, look, you invest, let's say, $40,000 in this note. I don't make a dime on this until you get paid off. And you can structure deals where you own half of the note, they own half of the note, or they own a third of the note, you own two-thirds of, of the note. So there's a lot of different ways that you can do that where everybody wins. And so there, there are several ways to do that. Yeah, that's that's great. You mentioned quite a quite a few interesting things in there. And one of the last things you mentioned was around some of the creative aspects of, of structuring the deal so that you can get into it. Uh, for those people who may not have the deep knowledge to, to know how to structure those deals, um, what are some ways they might be able to get something like that done? Is it, do you know, would you sort of use an attorney to help you figure that out? You just sort of let them know what you want to do basically and help get them to structure it or, or what would that look like? You can always use an attorney if you want to pay more money and waste more time. Sure. Uh, no, I'm kidding. You. No, Not a good yeah. idea then. <laughs> <laughs> now there are times when we do need an attorney for certain things, but for the most part in this business, we don't. Um, we might outsource certain things to servicing companies or professionals who you know, are experts in their field. For example, if you get into the note business, you can buy performing notes or non-performing notes if I wanted to break them into two categories. I don't think any of your listeners you know, would hear about the note business and, and think, oh, so I can buy, Kevin said I could buy real estate cheaper through notes. How can I do that? Well, you buy a non-performing note. A non-performing note's a problem, right? You're buying a problem, right. but you buy problems at discounts. And then you're going to fix that problem just like you would a, uh, would a house. And one of our exit strategies, of course, especially on vacant property, is to foreclose on the property or hopefully get a deed in lieu, right? Maybe cash for keys, deed in lieu. But we end up with the, um, uh, with the property. And then it becomes a matter of the uh, exit strategy that you simply implement from, uh, from there. I forgot my, uh, where I was going with that. Hit me with your question again. I'll come back to me in a second there. Yeah, it was, it was really for people who are just trying to get into this and maybe they're oh, gotcha. yep. not yep. savvy enough to know yep. how to put something creative together. What, you gotcha. know, how can they get that? Gotcha. Done? So when, when we go into these deals, again, it depends what you want your outcome. So going back to my example, if I buy a non-performing note and I, I'm, a, I'm a beginner, if there's still somebody living in the house, I don't think any of your listeners want to get into this and go, yeah, I can't wait to pick up a phone and call somebody and try to collect payments and back payments and get them started again. That's not why people get into that. That is something that you would outsource. So we were talking about attorneys. So yes, certain times we might have to have an attorney, certain times we're going to outsource uh, things, but there's a lot of things that you can do uh, on your own where you don't have to get involved uh, by outsourcing or using an attorney. It does set, take some basic knowledge. And for your listeners who are new to the concept of notes, ironically enough, people use notes every single day. They just don't know it. 
Uh, the example I use in my classes, for example, is uh, if you've ever written a check. You know, is a check a note? It's a promissory note, isn't it? I mean, you're giving somebody a check, but could that check uh, become non-performing? Yes, in theory, yeah. If it bounces, <laughs> right? yeah, yeah, they don't have the funds to cover it, so they're writing you an IOU, right? They're essentially writing you a debt instrument. That's a form of paper. That's a form of a note. If you take out a dollar bill out of your wallet and look on there, it's a Federal Reserve note. So we are buying notes, but our notes are a little different than those two examples in the fact that we're buying a long-term note, which could be up to thirty years, which represents monthly income streams over time. So I'm essentially in this business trading lump sum of cash now for monthly income streams over a long period of time. That's really the whole nature of the business. Now, if you're buying a non-performing note, those payments are not being made, right? So I get a much cheaper price and then I can get those payments made again if the people desire and show the willingness to, to be able to make the payments again. Uh, or I end up with the property through a deed in lieu or through a foreclosure. Yeah, that's great. I love the way you simplified it because this is kind of a, a mysterious unknown for a lot of people, especially if they're not a, a real estate investor. A lot of the folks who listen to our show have day jobs. They have an interest in investing, right? Yeah. But this is kind of a, a, a real unknown territory. So breaking it down and giving that simple example of a check, I love that. Now, one of the things a lot of people think and, um, and you know, they need someone to help explain to them is about the, the legality of it. And, you know, like with a check, I know I can just write a check and give it to someone. And they, but, but with the, boy, with property, it seems scary. It's like, well, what do you have to do to make that official and all of that? Yeah, <laughs> can you talk to that a little bit? Yeah, again, it's, it's a fairly simple concept here. So everybody refers to this as the note business. We buy notes. It used to be called the paper industry. Some of the people have been around a while still call it the paper industry because of the previous example I gave you that makes a lot of sense. But the reality is I don't buy just a note. I don't buy just a note because a note somebody may not perform on, right? So going back to the check example, if, if I write uh, you, Adam, a, a check for $1,000 and it becomes non-performing, you do have legal recourse, but the only thing you can do is sue me. And how much time and effort do you want to spend to sue me to try to collect the 1000 bucks? It probably costs you more to sue me than you would get back. Absolutely. Right. Right. Now, uh, what if I said, look, I, I need some some money, uh, Adam. And I say, uh, I'm going to borrow ten thousand dollars from you and I promise to pay you back. And I just write a promissory note where I'm going to pay you back. You give me the ten grand. You have a promissory note for ten uh, for ten thousand dollars. That'll pay you back in two years, whatever the, the time frame uh, might be. Well, I might perform on that, I might not. And you're in that same situation. If I don't perform, you have to sue me. But what if I took something of, of value here? So I've got, I'm looking around here. Let's say I've got something worth $20,000, okay? And I say, look, Adam, you give me the 10 grand. I will promise in writing to pay it back, but I have another agreement, okay, that says a security agreement that says, if I don't pay you back, you get to keep this thing that's worth 20 grand. I just took all your risk out of the equation, didn't I? Right. In fact, you're probably hoping I don't pay you back because you'd rather end up with that thing that's worth 20 grand, right? Yeah. And you could hold that or we have a third party hold that. That's really along the lines of the notes that we buy. So when somebody goes to a bank to borrow money to buy a house, they number one have to promise to pay it back. That's the promissory note. But they also sign a security agreement that says, if I don't pay you back, then you have the right to foreclose on the property. Okay, that's where the security comes in. So even though we call it the note business, I'm not just buying a note, I'm buying a secured note. I'm buying the note with that security agreement. That's what gives me the added value there. Because nice. now if I'm looking at a $100,000 house and I'm able to buy a note for $40,000 on that house, if I can get the people to start paying again, because maybe they lost their job, they hadn't worked in a couple of years, fell behind, and I work all that out, great. Maybe they still owe 90 grand on the house. I'll start getting income from that. If I can't do that, or they've already vacated the house, I'll outsource a skip tracer to try to track them down. Not hard to do in today's connected world, right? And uh, track them down and see if they're willing to sign a deed over. 
where I get the ownership of the property back. If they can't or I can't find them, then I'm going to have to foreclose on the property. But I've only invested $40,000, maybe another $3,000 in legal fees, but the house is worth $100,000. Nice. Hard for me to lose. So yeah. it's a way that I can control a lot of the risk involved uh, within these deals. And it's more forgiving than buying more traditional methodology of buying real estate today where you're paying 80000 or 90000 for that $100,000 house in as is condition. Your margins get way thin. And as you know, those margins can go away if you underestimated your rehab or something like that. With me being in it for forty grand, I have a little bit more leeway. Nice. I love that. That, yeah. that Woody, you're basically protected from the beginning. Yeah, and you should know all those numbers, right? This is very similar. I like to use analogies that people are familiar with. So your real estate investors who are listening to this, if they're going to buy a fixer upper house, let's say it's a broken house. Well, they go in and say, here's what I can buy that for. But then they also look at what's it going to cost me to fix it up? And then what's it going to be worth afterwards, the after repaired value? And they should go in <laughs> knowing what all those numbers are to the best of their ability, right? In the note business, especially on the non-performing side we're talking about here, I'm buying a broken note. People are not making the payments on it. So what's it going to cost to fix, me, fix it up, work out or foreclosure, right? And what is the value of the asset as is. Right. And that's really how you look at the same thing. So a lot of real estate investors do very well in the note business once they get uh, some additional knowledge on it because there's a lot of transferable skills. You know, valuing property is one thing. Estimating re, uh, rehabs is, is another thing. You know, so there's a lot of things that they'll be uh, familiar with. And that's just buying existing notes. I mean, one of the greatest techniques to do today is to sell property with seller finance and create your own paper, you know, that sort of stuff. Now, when you create your own paper, how does um, I, Dodd-Frank, and this is my ignorant understanding of that law. I know it's supposed to be consumer protection. How does an investor consider that or take care of that? That particular okay, the, the Dodd Frank Act, named after the two congressmen that that uh, passed that pushed that bill through, um, it's got some benefits, it's got some drawbacks, and in fact, there was over five hundred different uh, rules and regulations that were supposed to be implemented. Half of which are still not implemented, uh, all held up in committee. The the ones that affect us the most. Uh, when it comes to creating our own paper, our own seller finance note. Now, again, your real estate investors who are listening, you might be have a, you know, you have the secret channel to buy property cheap and you're going to continue to do that. No problem. You will, if you run the numbers, you'll make more money seller financing that house than you would if you uh, just turned around and sold it one time. I mean, why do you think all the auto dealers, for example, why do, where do you think automobile dealers make their, their, not dealers, but the, the manufacturers, where, where they make their money. It's all on the finance side, right? That's why they're, I mean, they're willing to do zero down this and that because they make all their money on the finance side. They don't want somebody to come in and pay cash, right? right? <laughs> so in, in the note space, the uh, real estate investors who buy property and acquire it and turn around and sell it with seller financing, you'll make a lot more money. The only thing you really have to look at when it comes to Dodd-Frank is what they call the ability to pay rule. So if you're seller financing a house for somebody, however you acquired, acquired it, non-performing note or foreclosure, whatever you're doing, however you acquired that, when you paper your way out, when you sell or finance it to somebody, you should probably outsource that if you're not familiar with, uh, with the state rules and regulations. But in most states, you don't have to. But what you would be buying by is you have to look at their ability to pay. So you'll need to see an income statement and a balance sheet, and probably on top of that, uh, taxes and, and such to show that, yes, they make enough money. Uh, we're not under the same qualifications as a bank. This is a non-qualified loan. But we can substantiate if things go wrong that, look, they showed us this, and based upon this, they had the ability to pay. That's it. To make it easy, it's one of those things you probably, in, in, in my recommendation with anybody, would just outsource it. And then you don't have to worry about all the things, because there's certain letters that have to go out and, and right. all of that. Um, so I wouldn't uh, personally do it that way. Not that you can't, but everybody wants to sleep at night, right? So do it the right way. <laughs> exactly. Worry about it. I mean, it only costs you 500 bucks. I've got a guy who's licensed in every single state. It costs $500 for them to make it Dodd-Frank compliant. And they even issue a Dodd-Frank compliant certificate. Then you have no worries. 500 bucks. 
So Kevin, for someone who wants to get into note investing uh, and, and they start looking at buying a list of potential notes or, or they look at a list from which they can try to get some notes, um, are there, is there anything around location of those properties that they should be looking for or is it done, is it, are they sort of grouped in a different way? Anything you could recommend around that when people are starting to look at a, a way to buy some notes? Sure. The, the location aspect, uh, everybody in traditional real estate has, it's been drilled in their head, location, location, location. And there's absolute validity with that. But a lot of that validity comes from, well, why location, 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 or invest in your own backyard became kind of an extension of that. Why invest in your own backyard? Because you know the numbers, you're familiar with what things are selling for. Today, even more traditional real estate investors are expanding their businesses because information, I mean, you guys are the tech guys, right? So we get <laughs> information is everywhere. It's not hard for us to look up comparable sales and this and that. I mean, we could know somebody's neighborhood better than they do today. You would agree with that, right? Yep. So yeah. in the note business, it's it, one of the other things that it enables an investor to do is take their business nationwide because we are more like banks, okay? We're, we're more like banks and we have to kind of have a, a mindset difference on there where I go to where the deals are. I don't care where the property is located. I care what it's worth. I care what the rents are in the area uh, to balance it out, to see what things might be renting for, to check valuation models, that sort of thing. I care, uh, I care about some of the demographics in the neighborhood, right? Uh, the crime rate and things like that. Yeah. But how hard is that to find today? You know, it, it's not. So you can do this really uh, anywhere. So when you start to look at list, the first thing you shouldn't look at is the state or the city, because a lot of the best deals I can tell you right now, geographically are going to be Midwest and Southeast. Now there'll be pockets of the Northeast and the Southwest, but the best where, where you're going to make your most money is the Midwest and the Southeast still today. And it's been that way for almost nine years. And you're going to see notes in cities and states that, Heck, you might not even be able to point it out on a map. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, you know, that, that's one thing for, for beginning investors. That is a little speed bump, I call it. I wouldn't call it a hurdle. It's a little speed bump that you have to get over. But once you start to look at it that way and understand uh, uh, it's more the numbers and the stories and all these deals, the location really doesn't matter. Now, having said that, and I know you got another question, but having said that, there are certain reasons you might target certain states. For example, if you're going to buy non-performing notes as just a new way to buy real estate, let's say some of your real estate listers go, I don't want to create notes and all. I just want to buy properties. But hey, if I can buy them at 30, 40 cents, that sounds good to me. They may want to focus on states that have a shorter foreclosure, a less expensive foreclosure. So we're here in Florida, Florida, 12 months and, in, and about two grand, right? To foreclose on an average foreclosure. You go up one state to uh, Georgia and it's 90 days in about 800 bucks. You go to Missouri, it's about 60 days. Okay. So there are some places, if I'm going to buy a non-performing note on a vacant property where I know I'm going to end up with a property, it's either going to be a deed in lieu uh, or a foreclosure because those folks aren't moving in, right? They close that chapter on their life. If I have to foreclose is one of my exit strategies I thought through and said, well, heck, why don't I focus on Georgia? And that way I'm only looking at, again, 800 bucks in 90 days and I'll just buy stuff there or Missouri. And there's a handful of other states uh, like that. There's still some state programs called Hardest Hit Funds, uh, the biggest state right now, uh, Alabama. Uh, Alabama's a great state to buy notes in, whether it's a, a non-performing note uh, that is owner-occupied or vacant, uh, because there are programs in place there. It's great if it's owner-occupied, because the government will pay you, the note holder, I think it's still 30, maybe might be 35 grand in that state, to help that person stay in the home, regardless of what you paid for the note, by the way. So there can be some compelling reasons, but it shouldn't be uh, uh, something that you say, oh, I'm just not buying anything in Ohio. There's great deals in Ohio. Okay. So to right. unpack the, the hardest hit fund and it, it basically what you're saying is if I purchase something in Alabama, I buy a note for $10,000, a non-performing note, and I try to work with the borrower, nothing's working. You think of the hardest hit fund and you're saying that the government would pay you up to 30000 to forgive the rest of the debt. Is that how that works? 
Well, they have several different programs. And um, to, to put some numbers for your example there in, in Alabama, so you bought a note for 10 grand, so, so maybe that house is worth uh, 50,000 bucks. And you bought the non-performing note for, for $10,000. And um, let's say that people are still living in the house. And something happened in their life. They were making payments maybe for five, six years, the economy turn, loss of job, loss of income, divorce, death, whatever happened, happened, and they haven't made a payment in four or five years. Now, some of your listeners might think, wow, what do you mean? They're still in our house after four or five years? Uh, yeah. There's still a lot of notes where they haven't made payments in four or five years because banks put kind of a freeze on foreclosures for a while. So they might be living in that house, but they live nearby. Their kids go to school there. They want to stay in that house and they've built up what's called an arrearage account. So whatever their monthly payment is on that, that uh, let's say they owe 40 grand on that $40,000 note, whatever that monthly payment is times four years is their arrearage account. So let's just say the arrearage account is, is 20 grand, <clears throat> okay? Their monthly payment, they could probably afford now. Maybe they're working again and everything's good. They could make the payment moving forward, but they've learned enough to say, even if I start making the payment, the bank is still gonna foreclose on me because of this arrearage account. There's an acceleration clause in all these loans. So they sit in limbo. They don't know what to do. And they're going, hey, we haven't been contacted in a couple of years now. Let's not send a payment to anybody because we don't want to <laughs> trigger them to go, oh, yeah, these folks, you know, where have they been making payments? So what could happen is you tell them to apply. See, they can apply right now. The problem is, is with hardest hit funds, this government program that people don't know about. Mm hmm. So your position becomes through you or outsource to let them know there is a program that can pay up to $35,000 to help them stay in their house. Now, even if Georgia says we'll pay up to 35 grand, in my example, I purposely chose 20 grand. Okay, so they have a $20,000 arrearage account here, which means you pay 10,000 for the note, the government's gonna give you 20. They're not going to give you the full 35 because uh, they don't owe 35. They, you know, they just owe 20 on the arrearage account. But what they might do is look at those folks and say, here's an addition to the 20,000 we'll give you. We're going to make their mortgage payment for the next year. We feel these folks need a little bit more time to get back on their feet. So George is going to automatically mailbox money to you. It's all wired now, but you know what I mean? Mailbox money to you for the next year or two. Um, so it could work that way as well, where you have some guaranteed payments in there. So other programs, they might come in and say, look, these folks, they just don't, it was a death in the family and the made bread winner is out and the, the person's a little bit older now and they can't really get a, a job to pay this. They owe you 40 grand. That's another reason I picked that number. They owe 40,000 on that note plus the arrearage account. Which right. Bring it to 60 grand on a house that's worth 50. Here's what the George is willing to do. They come to you, Kevin, and say, we'll give you 35,000. That's their max. Okay. If you forgive the entire debt. Interesting. And you assuming you, you bought it at a discount. Pay 10 grand for the note and they're going to pay you 35,000. All this happens in 90 days after they apply, by the way, that's the approval process. So there can be some compelling reasons uh, where you look in certain states. <laughs> yeah. Wow, that's interesting. So Kevin, let's say I'm, I'm a new note investor and I close on my first note. I find yeah. one, I get the note. But what are the first things I would do? Well, here's what uh, I think you'll enjoy this, Adam. So at a note closing, you're going to buy your first note. You don't go to the closing, number one. Okay. And there's nothing for you to sign at the closing. Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> you're not going to be there and you're gonna, there's nothing for you to sign. Very different than a real estate closing where everybody's doing this number, right? Yeah. Signing this and signing that and everybody's sitting around the table shuffling papers. On this, there's essentially two documents that are going to be signed. And that's the note and the security agreement that we were talking about earlier. So gotcha. if you're buying the note from me, uh, I'm going to assign those over to you. So there's nothing for me, or excuse me, there's nothing for you to sign. Think about this. If, um, if I uh, uh, receive a check from somebody for $8,000, and let's say I owe you $8,000, can I turn that check over and assign it over to you? 
Yes. And you right? Same kind of concept there. So I own this note and mortgage. I'm just going to sign them over to you. Interesting. So, you're going to now I would close it through an escrow company, right? So a third party, you're going to wire the money there. I'm going to give the documents there and, and they do like a title company would do, right? They exchange that they give me the money and they give you the note in the mortgage. Okay. Right? What you're going to do is hang on to those documents, but you're going to have the security agreement recorded in the County in which the property is located. So if this is a deal up in, in Georgia, you're just going to do a mail off and they record it. They send it back to you. Okay. And now it's workout time. So if it's a non-performing note, you're going to then have typically a workout company, servicing company, contact the people, see if they're interested in staying or if they want to go and, and start working out the deal from, from that. If it's a performing note that you're buying, so if I have a note that's performing, people are making payments like clockwork, but for whatever reason, I want to cash out of all of the note or part of it, by the way, and I sell that to you, you're going to send uh, uh, instructions, probably keep it at the same servicing company. You get paid next month and every month nice. thereafter. Okay. Yeah, that's great. Uh, I was curious month. about, you know, what that, you know, that second part you mentioned there is uh, something that not everybody knows about. Mm -hmm. And speaking of uh, things that not everybody knows about, I, I know that you and I, Kevin, have talked about different types of notes that you can purchase. And right now we're focusing on uh, notes and mortgages, but I know that you've also talked about how uh, purchasing like David Bowie's uh, royalties and stuff like that. <laughs> I know that that's still a note, right? So I'm just curious as to how somebody can, can find, first of all, what are some other creative notes that are out there to buy? Oh gosh, we, we bought years ago and I, I do remember sharing this, this with you here. Uh, we bought uh, football player contracts. You can buy actor and actresses royalties. And yes, I, I told you about the whole David Bowie story and you guys you know, Google it, look up David Bowie. They were called Bowie bonds. So David Bowie has built a massive collection of music and he gets royalties on those substantial royalties on a monthly basis. Well, it's the same thing. It's a monthly cash flow, long-term uh, cash flow that's coming in every month. So I don't know if it was his idea or somebody uh, financially assisting him on this, but whatever it was, they came up with the idea where, where David essentially said this, he goes, I'll sell for lump sum. Now I'll sell my next 10 years of royalties. Okay. Of, of to, to investors. And that's essentially what, uh, what they did. So he got a whole bunch of money and that's probably why he disappeared for a long time. And he said, I'm going to sell all next 10 years of royalties. And I'm also going to sell all the royalties for my next two albums. Interesting. Okay? So it ended up before he died, he recorded what? Two more albums. He got that done. Now it's a similar concept here. It's a, it's, it's in that case, I think, yeah, it was either monthly, maybe they paid out yearly, whatever it was, but it was, it was money coming in on a, on a regular basis, but you have to identify risk. And on the real estate side, our risk is what's that property worth, right? right? Could it go down in value? Could it go up in value? Is it stable? What's the crime? That sort of thing. With the David Bowie, same thing. You have to identify what the risk is and the risk is, that number one, his music is going to stop being played. You don't know if that's going to happen or not. It's unlikely, right? right. It's a risk based upon their amount of, of royalties that have been paid over a long period of time, which we in the note is called seasoning. Uh, so that's certainly a, a lower risk. But your biggest risk is David Bowie himself. What if he dies? Yeah. And he never produces those two albums. Well, you cover that with insurance. So David Bowie had a huge insurance policy on him that would pay the investors if he passed away before those, uh, those albums. It's the same thing with lotteries. We used to buy lottery winnings, uh, casino winnings. When you go to the uh, Las Vegas or wherever and you win on quarter mania, they'll take a picture with the big check. Okay. You won $10 million. I got news for you. You're not walking out with $10 million. If you look on the side of those machines, it's paid out over 30 years. 30 annual installments. It's like a mortgage. Yeah. Just like, a, a, you know, the lottery, the lotteries, when they first came out, and this is way before you guys uh, were even around, <laughs> <laughs> but when lotteries first came out, there was no lump sum option. It was all paid out over time. Our industry came in and said, look, you want a million bucks, but after taxes and everything, and after you're getting 30 grand a year, 
not quite the lifestyle changing event you thought winning a million bucks was. So <laughs> because that's public record, I would send out direct mail to you or contact you and say, look, I'm willing to pay you something less than a million. I'll say 600,000 lump sum. You assign those payments over to me. Interesting. Right? So some people would say, well, no, I'll just take the $30,000 a year because I know it's coming in every year for the next 30 years. And that with my pension or that with my income, I'm all good. But other people, probably younger people are going, wait a minute, if I had 600 grand and I invest that and just make 5%, there's 30 grand a year right there. So yeah. I'll take the, the 600,000. So it's the same thing. I, I, I'm not going to pay you a million dollars to collect those payments. I've got to buy it at a discount. That's why we're in the discount note business as it's also uh, known. So it's all cash flows. And it's all identifying what the risk is and then how much you're willing to pay uh, for that. Yeah, that's cool. I say take that 600,000 and buy some notes. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that's super cool hearing about it outside of real estate. I never, never really thought much about that. That's, do it for that's a period cool. of time. There was a, there was a football player years ago he was a, a lineman. He was making about 700 grand a year. And the way they work in the NFL is they get paid one sixteenth during the football season. So whatever that is on $700,000, that's what he uh, got paid uh, during the football season. So he wanted to invest in a restaurant now and wanted to sell next year's salary today. If we knew how to do the math, could you calculate and say, well, if I bought it at this price, I would make 12%. Or if I bought it at that price, I would make 10%. Sure you could, right? It's just present value of, of, of money. Um, so you go, all right, so I can lock in my return by setting a certain price on this because I know this is what he's going to get paid. And of course, I'm going to look at the paperwork. I'm going to look at the agreement here. And then I have to identify the risk. By yeah, the way, the risk on an NFL contract are on and off field behavior, have to be up to team standards. Okay. And the other one is their fitness has to be up to team standards. Those like are two that. things you cool. can't control. What if this guy gets drunk and he gets in a bar fight and they, he's off of that contract. Now we're in a, in a bunch of stuff. So once right. again, insurance will cover that. Lloyd's of London will write policies on all kinds of crazy stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's cool. Having the insurance on there is, <laughs> is crucial. So, um, Kevin, can By the you tell way, us? Do we have insurance on properties? When you buy a note, uh, yeah. a non performing <laughs> note, do you think you should buy what's called force place insurance on that property? Of course. What if it burns down, right? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. No, so that's interesting. What does uh, insurance look like on that? Is it? Um, it costs you know, you, uh, and if you're dealing in properties under one hundred and twenty thousand dollars, you're looking at six six to seven hundred dollars a year for what they call forced place insurance. Forced place insurance. Okay, you're forcing insurance on it because that's on vacant homes that you know the people just throw up their hands and left. And right. you're buying a non-performing note based upon that, you would just get a quick forced place insurance. If it's waterfront or something, it'll go up a couple hundred bucks a year. Okay. Okay, cool. Well, hey, Kevin, can you tell us about the, the MWM fund? What is that all about? Yeah, this is the, the newest thing and, and uh, there's nothing else like it. And I'm, I'm really, uh, re really happy to be a, a part of it. So full disclosure, I am a part of this fund that uh, was put together. I, the, the two guys who actually put the fund together, I trained in the business about seven years ago and they created a, a trading platform called Paperstack, which is a great place. You mentioned about where do people find notes. Uh, Paperstack, uh, no K on the end, paperstack.com, and they can look at inventory there. <clears throat> and those same gentlemen uh, created a fund. Them said they, they bought as much as they could with their money and said, well, now we need other people's money to expand the business and did that uh, with another fund. That fund is, is being closed out <clears throat> as we speak. The new fund that takes about a year to get, uh, you have to qualify for it. Um, it's it's called an SEC uh, Regulation A plus fund. And uh, if anybody wants to do research on what that is, I can give you the skinny on on what that is. These take all the best benefits of of many different business structures and puts it all in one. And what I mean by that is, on this fund, there is public disclosure, so anybody can look up the records. Recording, you have to do a, a recording semi-annually and annually. A reporting, I'm sorry, reporting on everything. So there's full transparency in the fund, which for investors is important. Yeah, and you'll absolutely. know what notes are being bought and everything like that. 
that. You can even log online and, and look at everything to do that. That's a requirement for this, uh, this fund. The other benefit on this type of fund is, unlike most funds, this one's open to both accredited and non-accredited investors. You know, it, it's unfortunate, but a lot of great funds are closed to non-accredited investors under the theory that the government's protecting these investors, but right. also the reality is they're cutting them out of those investment opportunities. So this fund took the best of both worlds and said, you can do accredited and non-accredited non-accred investors on this. And you have public disclosure, but it's still, the sales can be handled privately, meaning you don't pay a broker fee or anything like that. You can go to our fund website, which is mwmfund.com, read the disclosures and invest right there. And here's the bottom line. We can also set the share price on this and our minimum investment to own a portion of an entire portfolio that myself and my partners managed, uh, you know, all, all the years in between us and the track record, the minimum investment is $200, 200 wow. bucks. That's and very accessible. Portfolio of notes. And it's even set up on the website where you say, I want to do 200 bucks a month, or I've got money in my IRA or 401k that I want to invest. Can I do that? All of that you can do directly through the website. This gives the opportunity to, Everybody has, you know, you, you can come up with 200 bucks when the return is up to 10%, right? So up to 10% is what the fund makes. And that's before we even get paid, okay? So we have a high motivation to get these assets uh, uh, worked out uh, because we get, you know, uh, we make our money after the investors are paid first. And that's another huge benefit uh, to this uh, type of fund. Nobody else has anything like this uh, right now in the, in the note space at all. And uh, certainly nobody has the people uh, behind it that, uh, that we do as well. So my advice to people now for the first time ever is um, invest in a fund like that where it can be very, very passive and it's managed and you, you know what's going on all the time and then cherry pick the notes that you want to buy on, on your own. You no longer need to wait. I mean, a lot of times beginning investors, they keep looking for that perfect note. And next thing you know, a month turns into three, three turns into six. Here it's like, look, just start putting a little bit of money if that's uh, what you have uh, into the fund you know, and then start to look at the, uh, the other deals. So it's really, uh, in all the years I've been involved in this really since the infancy, uh, infancy of the, the industry, uh, this is a, this is a game changer. I love it. Well, congratulations on having, yeah. being a part of that. Yeah, oh, for sure. Way, uh, by the way, the MWM stands for money with meaning. So we also have a, a socially conscious company where our goal is to keep as many people in their home as possible. So we're not going out there as a, as a fund trying to just buy real estate as cheap as we can. We want to focus on deals where people are still in the home. They show the ability to start making payments again on the home. We want to buy their note, work with them so that they can stay in their, uh, in their homes. To the best oh, I love thing. it. Yeah. That is awesome. I really love that. Yeah, I love that social component. Now, right. when, when I hear the term fund, and I'm sure a lot of people think this way, you think of a hedge fund or something like that, or, or a REIT, a real estate investment trust, yeah. how does the MWM fund differ than those two entities? Yeah, again, there, there are some similarities uh, uh, to that because I often use the analogy, and it's not 100% accurate, but if people can identify with it, it's like you're buying a mutual fund that buys notes. You know, when you buy a mutual fund, with your retirement account or outside of your retirement account, whatever it is, and they invest in stocks. Uh, okay. You own a portion of all the portfolio and then there's your mixed mutual funds that own stocks and also own bonds in there, that sort of thing. And you just uh, get paid a percentage on that. This fund is going to focus on notes and we are going to do some HUD properties as well. We have a special way of, of, of doing that. So we're, we may have some regular real estate in there uh, as well. <clears throat> that would be cash flowing. Uh, to us through the uh, through the HUD properties and and such. So in a way, it is like a mutual fund. But with mutual funds, a lot of times they're publicly traded. Uh, right. You might you have to have your your money with a brokerage account, that sort of thing. With this, you don't. You go right to the website. You invest direct. You know, so all of your money goes right into the investment versus. Um, you know, I don't know if you can you can probably use some mutual funds today with only two hundred bucks. I don't know the what the what the cost of entry is on some of those funds either. They might require a certain amount of money for a deposit, you know, that sort of thing before it can go into those accounts. So, you know, if you're investing a thousand dollars into a mutual fund, but you had to pay whatever it is, 3%, 
uh, you know, as a part of it, you're not really investing a thousand bucks. Here, your two hundred dollars is two hundred dollars. It's invested uh, directly through the through the website. The real estate investment trusts. Um, are structured a little bit differently. Those do typically have much higher entry levels. A lot of those trusts prefer just to work with accredited investors, sophisticated investors, if you will, and they focus on uh, raising large amounts of, of capital. So a lot of real estate investment trusts, for example, buy big buildings. You know, they're they're looking for the high end commercial uh, uh, items, um, and there's no real um, social component. Not that that's important to everybody. Uh, but there's no real component on, on REITs where, where this one, we're targeting the best notes in the business, which are going to be on lower properties. And that's where people need the most help as well. So there is that aspect uh, uh, to it. But we're not competing with these big companies. You know, you, you can't compete with some, some companies. and some, I mean, some of these real estate investment trusts are just absolutely you know, massive and they control the space. They're not interested in, in the space that we work within. So our, our fund really is uh, unique in that aspect. Kevin, for people who might want to invest in, in that fund, but they're new to this type of thing, they've traditionally only invested in a 401k through work or a big mutual fund where, where they know the fund and, and they don't have experience doing due diligence or checking into it. And maybe they're not a uh, sophisticated investor like an accredited investor would be. What, what kind of due diligence might you encourage them to do so they feel comfortable investing in your fund? Sure. Uh, you always want to look at that. You go to mwmmoneywithmeaningfund.com. So mwmfund.com. The, the disclosures on there, what we do is on there. Our mission is on there. The entire SEC required documentation is on there so they can do their own due diligence. But a couple of other things here. Uh, couple hundred bucks you get to go in uh, go in the front door and, and kind of see how it works and the you know okay if it ends up being oh it's not what not what I what I thought you had 200 bucks in it you know what I mean it's not a not a big a big commitment for somebody as a second thing but here's what I've actually found out because I totally get the question uh, but anybody listening to this now you you if you own a, a mutual fund and there's stocks and, and such in there when you pick that fund let me guess, you thoroughly looked at all the stocks that they invest in, what percentage of stocks they invest in, you look at the research and development, you looked at the income statements of all those different companies before you chose that mutual fund, right? Of course, we all do that, right? <laughs> I didn't just hear it from a friend. Or, or somebody, somebody at work, you went, what are you doing? Okay, I'll do that same fund, right? I mean, <laughs> No, so no, that's you know, never. You got to keep it in perspective a little bit here. You know? it's like, oh, man, I got to go read my prospectus. What What's that? I said, I got to go read my prospectus. <laughs> exactly. What did you pick? You know, so I get the question, but again, the reality is no, even just people who buy, buy individual stocks, most of the time I, I saw it on the news or I read that. They didn't go look it up and research it Agreed. And, and everything else. But please, all of the disclosure for, forms and everything is, is on there. And obviously, you know, familiar yourself a, a little bit. If you want to learn more about notes, I got my book here I can promote too. Um, it's a bestseller on, on Amazon, just came out. It's called Real Estate Without Renters. And I think it's 19 bucks or something like that for the paperback version on Amazon. And it's 99 cents for the ebook version. You can still get it on there. Just search my name, Kevin Shortell or Real Estate Without Renters. And that'll give you a good idea about the industry and how it works. So you have some familiarity with that. And then you would also know that one of the people uh, working with that fund is, is, is myself. Fantastic. Excellent. I love that. Now, we, this has become one of our favorite questions to ask all of our guests because it's, it's happening, I guess. The, the crash is supposed to be coming. So we wanna know from your perspective, for note investors, how do you recommend they prepare for the impending crash? Well, one of the things I'm known for in the industry is research. And I'm kind of the go-to guy, even for other people who teach this, um, I'm kind of known as the go-to guy for the research. I've just been doing it. I got burned in real estate uh, years ago when, when the market crashed. I got caught. I was lending money. And it just happened so quick. And after that, I said, I've just got to know the marketplace because the signs were there. And when I was reflecting back on that, I said, man, I, I should have recognized that the crash was coming. And I just didn't like, like most people didn't. And after that, I've just gotten the habit of researching and, and on my website, which is all free, kevinshortel.com, S-H-R-T-L-E. 
uh, kevinshortel.com. Look at my blog on there, and I put all new data. I just did two blogs today, as a matter of fact, and put those up there. I've also got the podcast that people can can listen to, but the blog is especially for lo those looking for industry information. So having said that, what I see in the marketplace, potentially, yes, there could be a, a, a downplay in, in market prices. I don't think it'll be nearly as drastic, but here's the thing. It's going to be unfortunate if it happens and when it happens for the economy, but it's actually a good thing for our business. Hate to look at it that way, but that's the reality of it. The last big crash, what happened finally, and I think again, why notes has risen to its own kind of class of, of assets, if you will, has become much more widely recognized why everybody should have it in their portfolio is very quickly, banks figured out they can't handle the problem. They're simply not equipped to do it. They don't know how to take real estate back, fix it up, sell it again, all that sort of stuff. It was a nightmare for them. Uh, secondly, the government couldn't fix it. I mean, the HAMP loans and all that stuff that they were doing, complete disaster. In fact, the default rate on HAMP loans right now is massive. You have people on their third round of default. You have people are gaming the system on the defaults for HAMPs because they know how, how it works now. Uh, redefault rate is, is, is terrible on those. Um, so anyhow, if it happens like that, just like last time, the banks and governments realize they, they can't do the work out. It, it comes down to entrepreneurs like you and I. So for people like myself and you guys in, in the note business, it's actually a good thing. A lot of times what I'll see when I'm doing research is uh, like, oh boy, that's future inventory for us. Because think, think about it, they're already banks now doing 0% down, okay? Credit scores down to, uh, to uh, 520. Uh, and Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are buying all these things. What's happening today is more non-banks are doing loans than banks. And they are doing more non-qualified mortgages. But the banks are funding their warehouse lines of credit. And I've got, I mean, I've, I could go on for days on this stuff. I, I, I love that topic. But again, it's probably a little a little too lengthy for the, the time we have here, but those interested in, in seeing the statistics and everything, um, I, when, I, when I put out my blogs, I show you the stats. I'm not, I'm not just uh, making them up there. I show everything and interpret them for you. So for us, it's gonna be a, a, a good thing. Um, and I was just in Puerto Rico and, I, and uh, we're exploring the market down there in Puerto Rico. Uh, Puerto Rican banks were forced to take back bad loans from uh, uh, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, and some other entities and such, and they don't know how to handle them. They're overwhelmed. A couple of banks already closed in Puerto Rico. Uh, people need help there, and the banks are overwhelmed, and it's really a microcosm of what happened in the United States. So we went down there to look at properties and, and, and all sorts of things. So uh, just like... Uh, Again, if you look at that as a microcosm of what could uh, happen here again, we're fully equipped to, uh, to handle that. And I think the fund's going to play a big role in that, quite frankly, because what, what, the, what the MWM fund does for us is gives us the capital that we need to buy direct from banks. And once right. you get the power of that, now your prices come down even further. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's really interesting. Good answer. Um, so we wouldn't be the tech guys who invest, Kevin, if we didn't ask you some kind of a fun tech question. <laughs> <laughs> so what we're really curious about is what is a, a favorite piece of tech you had as a kid? Maybe something that you kind of are reminiscing about, you know, or, or something that was special to you when you were younger. Oh, man. See, when I was younger... Um Gosh, we didn't have all the high tech uh, stuff. <laughs> I, I, I was around. I remember I was probably, if it was, might have been late grade school or, or early high school when the first cell phones came out, you know, and they were the big, you've probably seen old pictures right. of old cell phones and stuff, you know, and it was, uh, those were crazy. Um, gosh, I, uh, we didn't really have any of that stuff growing up. I remember the first laptop that I bought, though. Oh my God, I'd have to ask my, my wife uh, what the heck that thing was. And I thought it was so cool. And oh God, it, was st it still had all the MS-DOS <laughs> and the floppy disk and everything. It did oh the, yeah. The, 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 the smaller ones at least. I, I, and uh, yeah, we didn't, have, uh, we didn't have a whole lot uh, uh, on that. But man, that laptop, I was like, this is sweet. And oh my God, I paid $1,200 for it. And wow. I mean, the, the technology. <laughs> Cause it was still like a green screen, you know, with the writing and all, it's all that stuff. Nice. Oh, it was horrible. And, uh, ended up selling that thing for about 
800 bucks, you know, it's today. I mean, the, the, the computing power that you get the $500, comp- well, the, even your phone, you know, same thing, <laughs> much more than, uh, much more than that. But, uh, that, that, those are a couple of things that I, I remember. That's awesome, man. The green screen sounds, sounds like a good match for our logo. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I'm sorry. Well, I know it wasn't a Mac. It was more of a, a you know, thing, but it was, it, it was one of those just like there was the screen was this big and then everything else was built around it. So yeah, like, totally. Yeah. One of those laptops. I was like, Ooh, I'm high roller now. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> All right, Kevin. Well, you've mentioned the, the book and your website, uh, and we'll definitely include those in the show notes. Is there anywhere else that people can find you? Yeah, the website, uh, again, is probably the best place, kevinshortel.com. And on there, I, I have, um, oh, events and things I'm gonna, uh, going to be at. Uh, I'm, I'm doing an event out in uh, Arizona. And if you're here locally, I'm, I'm doing some local trainings for the, the meetup groups here that I'm really doing at just really inexpensive prices and such. And, and uh, so if they go to my website, Kevin Shortel, it looks like Shortel, uh, dot com and s h r t l e and and they go to that website um it, it scroll down on the home page and just subscribe to the mailing list and i promise you i don't bombard people with a lot of stuff but that's the best way to stay in touch uh especially again if you're local and you want to come to some some classes and and i know kevin you've been to one or two of them now been to a couple uh, yeah i think and and uh uh, I laid out very well for people and, and, and give you some really, really uh, good things. And I'm, I'm, uh, we have something special here in central uh, Florida, but if you're listening, uh, you know, across the country as well, uh, I do webinars and such uh, also all the time. So go to the website's probably the best place uh, there. Uh, books on Amazon and uh, uh, podcast is, uh, is uh, I think really good too. So check that out. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Kevin, thanks so much. I, I really think this has been great. Very interesting. And I think you've added a ton of value. So uh, we, we very much appreciate you coming on the show. Thanks so uh, much. It was my, my pleasure. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Adam.